Товарищи! КПСС, Леонидом Ильичом It's the end. That's what I said to myself. I remember it with frightening clarity. It was the 25th of December, 1991. I was 33 years old and something died inside me. The greatest idea after Christianity, I was thinking. Socialism, dead. Born as a dream of brotherhood and justice, the utopia. For centuries, it seemed ludicrously unrealistic, but we raised it to state power. Its end was as dull and banal as the TV broadcast, which announced it. A 60-year-old bald man with a provincial accent was conceding defeat. The defeat of a superpower that nobody had ever conquered, but which defeated itself. I still can't quite believe that. 20 years on, and I see my socialism alive in my dreams. But when I wake, I do not whimper. It's dead and buried, gone forever, and there's nothing more to it. No, Dad, there is more to it. You want to forget that system you lived in? I decided to study history because I thought it should not be forgotten. All the terrible things we know about it, slave labor, mass murders, Stalin, the Gulag. In your time still, dissidents were tortured in psychiatric hospitals. People shot while escaping from the workers' paradise and a whole nation lied to about the disaster of Chernobyl. You were not around very much in the 80s when I was growing up. You said you couldn't stay with us in the West as you wanted to give socialism back home a chance. You told me that the Soviet Union would last forever. Now I want to know how come this empire, the biggest in world history, with all its satellite nations, all its armies, and security services surrendered without a shot? Why and how it happened? country's size and diversity. I was proud my language was spoken by dozens of peoples. That didn't make them at all inferior in my eyes. The union of the 15 Soviet republics was the only country in history not to have any national reference in its name. And that wasn't a formality for me. I didn't think of my people as of oppressors of others, and I was typical at that. Okay, I was taught to be proud of the beautiful city of Leningrad, St. Petersburg, the former imperial capital. But our ideology was double-edged. Russian cultural and historical heritage was okay because it was the people, often slaves, who built all that beauty. 
but Russian emperors' policies were bad because they exploited both their own people and all those they conquered. But the Soviet Union's map looked suspiciously similar to that of the Russian Empire. Noticeable exception being Finland and Poland, now out of the empire, but only really Finland in practice. In a way, the communist empire was larger than the Tsarist one, as it effectively controlled the borders of the Warsaw Pact European countries. I do not remember feeling the near presence of the German-German border, even though it cut right through the city I was growing up in, because I was still too small. But in retrospect, I realize how traumatized the German population was by it and the reforms of the Kremlin leader in the far away Moscow were not reaching far enough to alleviate the plight of ordinary citizens who felt imprisoned in this vastest empire on earth. Ich hatte so für mich immer das Gefühl, man man lebt irgendwie so eingesperrt und und man ist wie gehandicapt. Uwe Wirtwein grew up in Berungen, an East German village right next to the border with the West. Der Ort war sehr nah an der Grenze gelegen, etwa 1000 Meter. Und das hieß ganz konkret so ein Ort, der eigentlich nach drei Himmelsrichtungen von der Grenze umschlossen ist und dann in einer sogenannten Sperrzone liegt. Sperrzone bedeutet, es sind dort Hunde im Wald, gibt es Selbstschutzanlagen. Die ganze Umwelt hat zu mir gesagt, mein Umfeld, Eltern, Schule, man hat natürlich agitiert in Schulen, wo man gesagt hat, das war schon sozusagen schon immer so und das wird auch noch ewig so bleiben. Die DDR ist ja erstmal mit dem Wort Reisebeschränkung verbunden, dass junge Menschen so sozusagen beschränken in ihrem Wissensdurst und Abenteuerlust. Man, man wollte diese Enge loswerden. Und so haben wir mit dem Finger auf einer Russlandkarte in Sibirien einen Fluss ausgesucht, der 9000 Kilometer von hier weg ist. Ja, also können wir machen. Also ich habe alle Sowjetrepubliken bereist, individuell bereist, ohne organisierte Reisen. Habe dort viele Menschen kennengelernt. Da haben wir natürlich viel von Kulturen mitgekriegt. Wir haben einfach die Realität äh, gesehen, wie sie war. Es gibt einfach auch, auch Leid und Elend. Äh, da haben wir da Schicksale auch mitbekommen, wo wir dachten, na ja, die Realität ist einfach auch teilweise echt hart. Es ist ja sozusagen auch über die Jahrzehnte, Jahrhunderte zusammengeraubtes, zusammengestückeltes Land. Ich meine, gesamt Sibirien ist Kolonie. Die Russen sind eigentlich Kolonialisatoren. Und wir haben das dort am eigenen Leib erfahren. Wir sind als Weiße jetzt mitgenommen worden auf einem LKW und es war noch genug Platz. Und, und, und es trennten Jakuten. Die Fahrer haben gesagt, ja, Jakuten, ja. das waren wie, wie Sklaven. Also man, man, hat, man hat die sozusagen nicht beachtet, es waren minderwertige Leute. So an East German tourist saw things in the USSR you didn't see, such as colonialism. But then again, Soviet imperialism and Russian colonialism are two different things, or are they? Das, was bis 1917 Völkergefängnis hieß, hieß dann plötzlich äh, irgendwie sozialistische Gemeinschaft oder so. Klaus Labs, an East German translator of literature. Letztendlich, dass es um eine Russifizierung auch des also Zentralasiens gegen Mittelasiens, das ist mir auch sehr deutlich geworden, als ich 1987 da war. Also wir waren am Bucharer Samarkand und das war alles verstaatlicht, das war alles russifiziert, das umgeht nicht mehr. Ich kann mich entsinnen, dass mich diese Reise doch auch ziemlich bedrückte. Also da sah man schon ein bisschen auch den Umgang mit den anderen Kulturen. Und letztendlich war das für mich immer auch äh, eine Art von Kolonialismus. Ja. Äh, aber das Wort, um Gottes Willen, das war natürlich total tabu. Lagle Parek, an Estonian dissident and a post-communist politician. 
Ja kell neli omikul tauti siis igale pool akentele ja siis saabusid siis kaks ofitseri ja kuus sõdurit ja kaks tõlki. Ja me ootame vanaemaga siis ülekuulamisele viimist, no ma olen seitsme aastane. Ja seisan vanaema kõrval ja, ja paras ja kui tulevad nüüd nutvad inimesed, kohe tuuaks inimesed nutavad ja vanaema ütleb mulle, meie siin ei nuta, see oli meie reegel. Määratud väljas, et meie kui kodanliku nationalisti perekond oleme määratud välja saatmisele igamiseks Siberisse. 49. aasta küüditamine oli Eestis natuke rohkem kui 22 000 inimest. История 20 века на 90% села из табун, 99, я не знаю, но я, я, это не будет преувеличением. Борис Беленкин, a leading researcher of the memorial, a history and human rights society. Она была, ну, условно говоря, на 50% молчания, на 50% фальсификации. Начиная уж с, 80, с конца 86 -го года, гласность публикаций в журналах, газетах, в СМИ, а они, естественно, приковывали к себе просто ну, массовое внимание масс. Пожалуйста, дамы и господа, из книги «Кремлевские интриги» путь от Сталина до Горбачева. В Москве это было очень интересно. Я у милиции служу, а любимый мундир ношу. С кабурой на боку и я порядок навожу. Ich habe mir dann ein paar Presserzeugnisse gekauft, die es in der DDR nicht mehr zu kaufen gab. Es wurde immer schwerer, in der DDR sowjetische Zeitungen und Zeitschriften zu bekommen. Und das war ja unsere einzige Quelle, um etwas zu erfahren, wie es läuft mit der Perestroika. Da gab es dann zum Beispiel auch diesen Sputnik. Das war so ein Digest mit Artikeln aus der ganzen sowjetischen Presse. Aber die Redaktion vom Sputnik war wohl sehr äh, auf der Gorbatschow-Linie oder überhaupt noch ein bisschen radikaler. Und da kam es zum ersten Mal in der DDR dazu, dass eine sowjetische Zeitung regelrecht quasi verboten wurde. In einem dieser Geschichtsaufsätze war dann auch die Rede von der Vergleich Hitler-Stalin. Und gerade da war man in der DDR sehr empfindlich. Das ist Газеты, радио, все очень изменилось. Я текели культ, кокуаек, лоэти, нейт раматуй, тиат мне оли раматуй, дайте кэс, кэтте, кел вэхэги хуви оли та сай, пиагу кэйке лукэта. Я молотов Риппентропи пакт, эй олнут мейле саладус. The Molotov Ribbentrop Pact was named after Soviet and Nazi foreign ministers. Shortly before midnight, on August 23, 1939, the USSR and Nazi Germany signed a treaty, a part of which was not intended for public. Seven days later, the Second World War broke out. I learned at school that Germany started it by invading Poland. The truth is that in September 1939, Poland was attacked from both the West and the East by the Soviet Union, as well as Germany, in accordance with the Molotov-Ribbentrop Treaty. In addition to Eastern Poland, the Soviet Union occupied the Baltic countries, parts of Romania, and after a bitter Finnish resistance, parts of Eastern Finland. We would like to be a communist regime. Aga see ühendas meid ikkagi kõike, see vast... No tähendab, see ideoloogia. In 1988, Gorbachev allowed Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania to use their national flags instead of their Soviet Union Republic zones. Ma arvan, et... Gorbatsjoviga koos tulid ka lootused. Gorbatsjovi üks viku oli see, et ta siiski ei saanud aru rahvuslusest. 
sest tema jaoks olid ilmselt kõik need rahvusliku tärkamised väga suur üllatus. Having introduced Glasnost, the freedom of speech, Gorbachev had difficulties applying the term imperialism or empire to the Soviet Union. A bit like you. In Moscow, Gorbachev had the issue of Soviet imperialism elucidated by the former dissident Andrei Sakharov. Люди очень быстро стали понимать, что наше историческое прошлое страшно чудовищное и так далее. Что в наших шкафах там не просто скелеты, а я не знаю что там. Кладбище, 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 кладбище. И с этим надо что-то делать. Тут был ров, сделали деревянный настил и прям привозили этих убиенных голых и мужчин и женщин совершенно голых и ссыпали, кидали на этот настил. А мы тут купались в этом пруду. И вот эти покойники по настилу то выплывали прям в пруд. Пошел трупный яд. Никого не стали пускать купаться. И люди понимали, что разверзается, да, некоторая бездна, которая, ну что-то с этим надо делать. И вот э, появилась группа людей, которая потребовала создания мемориала жертвам политических репрессий. Мемориал имел в виду некий памятный комплекс архивом, музеем, библиотекой. Вот э, некий комплекс, посвященный значит, жертвам репрессий, который будет исследовать эту проблему. Затем сюда стали приходить и сами репрессированные, их дети и так далее. Раз в неделю я был в приемной. Репрессия 37 год, а дата смерти не установлена. Значит, вот приговор военной коллеги, это расстрел. То есть мимо меня прошли сотни и сотни людей. Там указано, приговор, придет исполнение, точка. Приходит человек и говорит, мне страшно, ему трудно вспоминать. Когда маму арестовали второй раз, она исчезла просто. Мы не знали долго, где она. Лариса Гармаш, a daughter of a victim of Stalin's terror. И я была одна в классе, у кого не было мамы. Меня называли врагом народа. Конечно, дети называли во дворе. Письмо великому вождю народа, учителю и другу советской молодежи, товарищу Иосифу Виссарионовичу Сталину. Как только Горбачев пришел, именно в те годы по-настоящему узнали, что такое э, приговор э, 10 лет без права переписки. А на самом деле это ВМН, высшая мера наказания, расстрел. Но я точно знала, что я приду в мемориал. Но я уже знала, что это Сахаров, инициатор, да, что это его идея была об увековечении памяти. Наша страна потеряла от незаконных репрессий, от организованного голода. Картотека расстрелянных в Москве годы большого террора, фотографии из следственных дел. Все эти люди фотографировались в тюрьме. Колхозник, продавец, замнаркома, кто угодно. Расстрелянные по выдуманным обвинениям. Абсолютно все, без исключения, реабилитированы, признаны невиновными. О 
almost every Soviet family, mine included, had a victim of Stalin's terror. Letting the truth be told about Stalin's reign of terror was undoubtedly crucial for Gorbachev's democratization. But there were issues Gorbachev's openness was less open about. For example, the challenge from Boris Yeltsin, the maverick Moscow party boss, aspiring for more radical reforms than those of Gorbachev. Yes, we heard of Yeltsin's critical speech at the party plenum at the end of 1987. The speech wasn't filmed, nor published, but the country was abuzz with rumors about its radical pro-democracy content and upset by the campaign of threats the party conservatives subjected Yeltsin to. Пусть все, что считает Борис Николаевич, сказать скажет. А если что у нас появится с вами, тоже можно сказать. Пожалуйста, Борис Николаевич. Товарищи делегаты, реабилитация через 50 лет сейчас стала привычной. И это хорошо действует на оздоровление общества. Но я лично прошу политической реабилитации все же при жизни. Слово предоставляется товарищу Легачеву Егору Кузьмичу, члену политбюро секретаря ЦК КПСС. Уважаемый товарищ, нельзя молчать, потому что коммунист Ельцин встал на неправильный путь. Оказалось, что человек обладает не созидательной, а разрушительной силой. А объективно говоря, направлено на то, чтобы почеять сомнения. А это очень так ждут от нас за рубежом. Посеять сомнения в правильности проведения политического курса партии. Прости мне, но мы с тобой уже расходимся не только в тактике, но и в стратегии. Yeltsin was removed from the position of the Moscow party chairman and resigned from the Politburo candidate. The party, and even Gorbachev, seemed bent on isolating Yeltsin. But in 1988, people were no longer afraid of supporting rebels, and Yeltsin was quickly becoming people's hero. The anti-corruption drive was like a breath of fresh air in the world ruled by communist dogma. Exposing lies became the main cause of the time, and Yeltsin its number one champion. Exposing lies destabilized communism, didn't it? Some communist leaders took no chances. Romania looked more stable than the USSR. But what was the price? And what was the real meaning of that stability? Ceausescu's favorite project was the People's House in the center of Bucharest. The building started in 1984 and finished only in 1989. It was to become the biggest palace in the world. Ceausescu's neo-Stalinism was practiced in a country which had less resources than the Soviet Union. That meant food rationing, gas, electricity and heating blackouts for the ordinary Romanians. The choice of the location of the palace, made by Ceausescu, was quite remarkable. He, when he assisted to the cutremur of the devastator in 1977, he saw more than 3,000 people in Bucharest. Paul Kozigian, a former student from Bucharest. 
El și-a dat seama că Bucureștiul este într-o zonă tectonică periculoasă și a fost, el era îngrozit să nu moară. Și atunci, vizitând Bucureștiul, a vizitat și această zonă și a văzut că acolo clădirile rămăseseră toate în picioare și nu aveau nicio zgârietură, nicio fisură, nimic. Deci el și-a zis, ăsta este un loc bun unde noi putem să ne mutăm sediul guvernului, să facem un bunker și așa mai departe, să ne mutăm aici totul, pentru că în caz de cutremur, noi nu o să pățim nimic aici. Deci Ceaușescu a decis să radă cartierul istoric al Bucureștiului. Cu aceeași ocazie a decis să distrugă și o mare parte din bisericile din București. Ce a făcut atunci a securitatea? O biserică celebră din București se numea Sfânta Vine. Băi, păi, de te fui, te fui! Băi, ziua de 22! A venit vremea înapoi Să te iei, frate, și noi să trăim Not only did the city dwellers have to suffer for the palace, but the peasants did as well. Faptul că cei de la țară nu aveau voie la unt, salam, cașcaval. Ioana Anton, a teacher from a village a hundred kilometers north of Bucharest. Sau mergeai la București, am mers cu tata Dumnezeu să lierte. A stat de rușine casiera. I-a dat 100 de grame de salam și tata, ca o contrareacție, a mâncat-o de față cu o vânzătoare. Se arate ce înseamnă stat o jumătate de oră la coadă și luat salam. Da. Și a treia oară ne-am așezat la coadă fără să întrebăm ce se vinde. Și după o oră și două am ajuns în față. Ciocolată chinezească. Și am cumpărat o geantă de ciocolată chinezească. Pentru că nu, nu renta să ratezi o asemenea ocazie. Au mâncat fetele noastre o lună ciocolată chinezească. Asta era sistemul. Ciocolită poielată, ca să trăim în dreptate, să trăim în libertate, să trăim în Ceaușescu era fiul bețivului satului. Sergiu Celac, Ceaușescu's interpreter until 1978. Iar uh, satul, mediul rural, tradițional, patriarhal, operează după niște criterii și niște tipare morale foarte stricte, dar care pot să fie foarte crude. Și atunci bănuiesc că alți copii strigau pe ulița satului fiul lui Bețivu, fiul lui Bețivu. De aici se trage ura autentică și profundă pe care Ceaușescu avea față de mediul rural față de satul în care s-a născut, față de țără nime, probabil că în spoiala de cultură filozofică marxistă elementară a reținut și înțelepciunea lui Lenin, care a caracterizat țără nimea drept cel mai mare pericol pentru comunism, se temea cel mai tare de țărani, de țără nime, poate mai tare decât de intelectuali. Pentru că considera că până la urmă intelectualii cu mintea lui de atunci pot fi cumpărați. Perhaps the most ambitious of Ceaușescu's plans was called systematization. Under it, traditional villages and agriculture were to be liquidated. Peasants relocated to the cities or new collective lodgings. What did the peasants think about it? Nu are cea niciodată. Mai bine de așa. Nici copii, nu, nu și nu. Tot. Aici. Muncă cu muncă să... Muncă, prin muncă. Orașan. Orașan aici ești un... Îl mai dă jos om. Two-thirds of Romanian villages, many of them with highly valuable historic architecture, were marked for destruction. A plan that was carried out to a large degree. Aveam o casă modestă cu grădină, cu vie, cu ca orice om în curte să avem necesarul de legume. Costel Ardelianu, a former villager. Un proiect pe care l-am văzut și între, după aceea, care vor să, să fie localitatea cât mai restrânsă, să fie cât mai mult teren agricol, ca să poată să cultive foarte mult. Deci să mai fie o singură casă, să fie, de exemplu, cum erau blocurile aici la noi, 
într-un bloc sunt 18 familii, deci nu o să fie o singură casă cu o singură familie, sunt 18 familii. Some were killed while refusing to leave their homes. Mi s-a propus să facem actele în locul la casa demolată să ne dea apartamentul. La urmă s-au răzgândit. Deci, în momentul când le-au scos la vânzare, am fost nevoie să le, le cumpărăm. Pentru ei au fost foarte greu. Eu care în vârstă, mai ales când uh, le-au stricat munca de o viață. But even in nondescript concrete buildings with kitchens and bathrooms shared by several families, life had to go on. Sigur, ne trăiam tinerețe, dar pe de altă parte o viață sexuală foarte încorsetată și foarte timorată. Prezervative nu erau, anticoncepționale foarte rar. Laura Grunberg, a former sociology student. Deci, în toată perioada asta, sensul faptului că s-a dat acel decret faimos prin care nu mai puteai să... nu aveai voie să faci avorturi și decât după patru copii și erai mamă eroină la cinci copii și așa mai departe, era o ambiție, după mine, a lui Ceaușescu de a demonstra o creștere a natalității și o demografie extraordinară cu care noi am și făcut vâlvă la, rest, la momentul respectiv. Eram foarte apreciați statistic vorbind, pentru rata de natalitate din, din România, până s-a aflat, de fapt, cu ce preț se făceau lucrurile astea. Se întâmpl- deci a fost în 83, deci eram în am ră- două luni, din cât, adică ce mi amintesc este că uh, erau mai multe variante ca opțiune de a te rezolva în condițiile în care nu eram nici eu, nici el pregătiți pentru a avea un copil sau nu eram căsătoriți. Ce... Uh, și era și o chestie de buget. Uh, fie trebuia să găsești pe cineva care ți-ar fi dat un fel de cocktail de, me- cel puțin asta mai amintesc, un fel de cocktail de medicamente, un fel de pilula de a doua zi de acum. Următorul ar fi fost să găsești pe cineva care să-ți facă o întrerupere de sarcină, ceea ce am făcut eu cu o sondă. Seara mi s-a făcut rău. Am tot așteptat, crezând că e mica hemoragie, așa, însă mie mi s-a făcut din ce în ce mai rău și am ajuns la spital la Cantacuzino, la gardă. Acest doctor, absolut întâmplător la care am ajuns, s-a prins în 30 de secunde despre ce-i vorba și vrea să mă salveze. Deci eu eram de operat pe loc, nu mai era de discuție așa. M-am trezit într-un salon cu vreo 20 de paturi cu fete de vârste diferite, dar știu, veneau, Adresa, îi vedeam polițiștii, cu declarații, cu nu știu ce, da? Să spui cine ți-a făcut, să dai toate informațiile, să... și puteai să bagi la închisoare pe persoana respectivă, plus tu, plus... Catalin and Imre Zilaghi former members of the Hungarian minority in Romania. Să egyik halálesetnek sem lenne szabad megtörténnie, de ennek igazából nem lett volna szabad. A férjemnek a 20 éves 20 éves huga halt meg nagyon tragikus módon egy tiltott abortusban. Másodjára terhes maradt egy kisbabával és nem 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 vállalták ezt a gyermeket és el kellett menjen egy tiltott abortuszt végrehajtatni, és ebbe ő belehalt. Ezt úgy tudtam meg, hogy a szüleim főhívtak. Először csak azt mondták, hogy, hogy nagy baj van, nagy baj van. És ő reakcióm az volt, hogy akkor szaladjunk, adjunk vért, vagy valami megoldást kell találni erre. De aztán megmondták, hogy, hogy ez a dolog, ez megtörtént. Sógornőm hajnalban halt meg kórházban, és... Reggel kilenckor már minnyáján be voltunk gyűjtve. A rendőrségen minnyájunkat külön kihallgató teremben egyenként hallgattak ki. Ez mindannyiszor jegyzőkönyvet jelent, mindannyiszor aláírni. Ez reggeltől eltartott Ott én letettem a nagy esküt a 
Nagyváradi Román rendőrség épülete előtt, hogy én soha többet nem fogok ide kerülni, én mindent megteszek, hogy ide és ilyen helyzetbe soha többet ne kerüljek. Ami adódik az első alkalom, én eljövök. Voltak barátaink, akik szintén átszöktek, sikerült nekik, akkor hallottunk olyanokat, akiket megfogtak, akkor mindjárt visszakoztunk, mert elkezdtünk félni, <gül> hogy mi lesz velünk is, de akkor csak úgy, csak latolgatta az ember, hogy hogy legyen, mint legyen, és végül csak azt a döntést hoztuk, hogy a jövő szempontjából az volna a jó, hogyha megtennénk ezt a lépést. Elindultunk, a férjem a csomagtartóba lapult, persze, hogy az utat a városba végig sírtuk, az embernek az időérzéke ilyenkor másképp működik. De körülbelül 40 perc volt egy olyan háromnegyed óra. Megálltunk, a férjem kimászott a csomagtartóból. Ami nagyon szokatlan és furcsa volt, akkoriban Romániában az utcai közvilágítás az szinte nulla volt. Tehát nem, nem égtek az utcai lámpák, viszont előttünk, ugye Magyarország fényei gyönyörűen megvilágították az eget. Tehát egy aranyfényű, narancsfényű fényburkot láttunk előttünk, ami felé indultunk, és mögöttünk meg sötét volt. The People's Republic of Hungary was like a promised land for ethnic Hungarians from Romania. The internationalist nature of communism, the thing you told me was the most valuable about the system, was by and large wishful thinking. The minorities' problems were not solved, but swept under the carpet of ideology. A star historian of Gorbachev's era, Yuri Afanasyev, gave a revealing interpretation of communist imperialism. Russia and Soviet Union остаются или были и остаются идеократическими империями, а не колониальными, собственно, колониальными, какими были, например, ну, Австро-Венгрия, Британия, Испания, да. Что такое Российская империя? Эту империю можно было охарактеризовать как теократическую. То есть, когда идея являлась тем островом, вокруг которого, собственно говоря, все и образовывалось. Вот Россия образовалась как большое общество и единое государство с идеологемой Москва Третий Рим. In 1988, we were waking up to the fact that our socialism may have been more of a continuation of our pre-revolutionary historical traditions than breaking with them. We celebrated the millennium of the introduction of Christianity in Russia, or Rus, as our country was called a thousand years ago. The center of Rus wasn't Moscow, but Kiev, in what then became the Ukraine. Glasnost and perestroika meant liberalization also in the field of religion, which had been quasi-suppressed by the pre-Gorbachev communists. People were hungry for faith, and it didn't matter to most that our church had been reconstructed by Stalin for his propaganda purposes during the war after he almost totally destroyed it in the 20s and the 30s. And it was no secret that priesthood was infiltrated by the KGB. With all the demurs, the church seemed to give a chance of stability to the increasingly confused country. Wasn't it a little naive to expect the Russian Orthodox Church to be the uniting force in an empire comprising of hundreds of nationalities in all major religions, including Buddhism, paganism, 
and of course Islam. Für 1988 hatte ich mir vorgenommen, eine große Reise durch Aserbaidschan, Armenien und Georgien. Und da war auch ein Angebot vom Reisebüro der DDR. Und dann kamen auch schon die ersten Nachrichten aus Sumgait, Unruhen zwischen Armeniern und Aserbaidschanern. Und ich frage noch auf dem Flugplatz, ob auch sicher ist, dass wir ankommen, weil die Reise war ja nicht ganz billig. Und ich hatte schon irgendwie ein schlechtes Gefühl. Und das hat es noch nie gegeben, dass eine DDR-Reisegruppe nicht an ihrem Ziel angekommen wäre in der Sowjetunion, wo ich beruhigt natürlich und so. Und dann sind wir bis Moskau gekommen. Und da hieß es dann, äh, Baku nicht möglich. Baku is a capital of a strategically important republic of Azerbaijan. It is trying to get hold of Azerbaijan with its huge quality oil reserve that Hitler risked all in Stalingrad that city being on the way to Azerbaijan. And it was the Soviet Republic of Azerbaijan that, as a result of a conflict with the Soviet Armenia, produced the first major secessionist challenge to Moscow. You know, I wouldn't say that always the Kavkaz был горячим регионом. Тут веками проживали, жили, бок о бок и нормально жили. Но последствия сталинской политики, конечно, они оставили уродливые шрамы. Father Parkiev, an Orthodox bishop of Nagorny Karabakh. И вот это чувство несправедливости, конечно, возмущало то этих, то тех, конечно. И вот последствия, конечно, это как бы заложенные были медленные мины. Joseph Stalin's first job in the communist government was nationalitist minister. And all along during his rule, he was redrawing the empire's map and moving whole peoples around, such as Germans from the Volga region, Karachai, Kalmyks, Chechens, Ingush, Balkars, Meshetan Turks, Crimean Tatars, Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians, Belarusians, Ukrainians, Moldavians were all subjected to master rotations, tens of thousands in each case. Those policies proved to be time bombs which started to explode once the Kremlin's Ivan rule loosened its grip. Stalin's first major decree in 1923 was to give the predominantly Armenian enclave of Nagorny Karabakh to Azerbaijan. an ancient Armenian land. According to the most independent accounts, Armenians settled in nagorno karabakh in the second century before Christ, Armenia then becoming the oldest Christian nation in the world. But claims of being an older culture, of having been around before Christ, etc., was a typical non-constructive way of resolving ethnic conflicts, wasn't it? Советский Союз разрешает какой-то автономной области или республики уйти из состава одной республики и войти в другую. Это разрешалось. И Карабах э, требовал выйти из состава Азербайджана, войти из состава Армении. Причем они прошли все этапы, все сессии, приняли все референдумы, прошли. Все как полагалось. Но в ответ сумгаитские погромы в 88 году. шли погромы, убивали армян, потом Мамон Азербайджанский, советские войска. Much as it is impossible not to feel for innocent victims of ethnic conflicts, it is hardly ever possible to blame one party for it. And the obvious Armenian suffering notwithstanding, it has to be said that in the 88 Azeri-Armenian conflict, the first victims were Azeris. <laughs> Twenty-two February, in the Azerbaijan region, there was the first blood. There were two 
двое азербайджанских юношей, несколько десятков получили ранения. One thing united the bitter enemies in this war, Azeris and Armenians. Both accused Stalin of laying foundation for conflicts. Mikhail Gorbachev was an unwilling heir to all the trouble. Когда Карабах требовал освобождения или присоединения к Армении, Горбачев говорит, а вы забыли о полумиллионах армянах, которые живут в Азербайджане? Он дал намек на погромы, чтобы напугать армянский народ. Such veiled threats were perhaps Gorbachev's way of making peace inside the empire. But outside the country, in the UN headquarters, he was a star peacemaker, an unlikely communist altruist. Сила и угроза силой не могут более и не должны быть инструментами внешней политики. Прежде всего, это относится к ядерному оружию, но дело не только в нем. От всех, а от более сильных в первую очередь, требуется самоограничение и полное исключение применения силы вовне. Такой первый важнейший компонент ненасильственного мира – как идеала, который мы вместе с Индией провозгласили и к которому мы приглашаем следовать. Of course, one can easily expose hypocrisy in a politician. And of course, the Soviet Union was an empire, even under Gorbachev. But the second most influential man in Soviet politics was Eduard Shevardnadze, from one of the most rebellious Soviet regions, Georgia. Kaloni, Russian Empire. Russia was a decade, decade, two hundred years. We all, us, in our schools, in our primary, we all knew what it was like to be a colony. But they didn't do anything bad. For these two hundred years, from the Trilateral Road, Petersburg, where Moscow, Odessa, where there were higher education institutions, young people. образованные, которые хотели получить высшее образование в зарубежных странах, в основном эти учились в Петербурге, Москве, в Одессе и других городах. Потом, когда они вернулись, это были очень толковые, талантливые люди, они основали свои школы, математическую, физическую, геологическую, языковедческую и так далее. Irma Sokhadze, a Georgian, was the most famous Soviet child star, called the Orange Girl, thanks to her hit song, The Orange Sky. I was born in the Soviet Union. I didn't understand that чем эта страна плоха. Я правда думала, что лучше страны нет, что так больно нигде человек не может дышать. Это огромное пространство, Советский Союз, представляете? У одной России было достаточно, и той любви, которой меня дарила Россия. Потому что эти песни, эти стихи и в школе, и в семье, это было такое родное, такое свое, такое... Светит незнакомая звезда. Но это не только наши песни и песни. There was also responsibility that the Soviet center had with regards to the orderly coexistence of the peoples of the Union. But the troubles kept erupting one after another, and not only between the Union republics, but also within them. In Georgia, for example, which had its own separatist problem in Abkhazia, where officers from my native Leningrad were caught in the crossfire. <laughs> Вышел 
Georgia's role among the Soviet republics was perhaps the most ambiguous. It was the center of the Soviet joie de vivre and looked the richest of the republics. Georgia was one of the most confrontational regions, but also the home of the embodiment and the master of the empire, Joseph Stalin. In the Georgian capital, Tbilisi, in April 1989, the Soviet center became involved in an event which turned out to be one of the most tragic of the Gorbachev period. How can we trust them? They are talking about democracy, they are talking about perestroika, and they are killing their own people. It was a totally appalling act, whereby innocent people were hit and cut to death by soldiers' spades. In Moscow, General Radionov justified the army's action. Говорят о мирном характере митинга, забывают, что над центральным проспектом города день и ночь раздавались гнусные призывы к физической расправе с коммунистами, разжигались антирусские и националистические настроения, лозунги, зачитываю лозунги, самые распространенные по всему городу и особенно в районе дома правительства, в том числе на английском языке. Долой русский коммунизм, русские захватчики долой из Грузии, долой прогнивший русскую империю, долой коммунистический режим, СССР тюрьма народов. И осталась крайняя мера принять силу. I was in Georgia twice in the two and a half years that followed the massacre. It was still my country, and I was proud of Georgia's beauty and her ancient culture, as of something belonging to me. I just loved it, and I didn't feel it was somehow imperialist of me. But the jury of history was out, and the judgment on the future of our union wasn't going to take long, nor to spare my feelings.